Hello, today we shall look at melt spinning. So the process of melt spinning, the viscous molten polymer is forced through a nozzle like a shower to produce fibers. So this is how the nozzle looks like. It looks almost like a household shower and the fibers will come out of this. The nozzles are known as spinnerets. What are the reasons for the popularity of melt spinning? It is much more popular than other ways of manufacturing fibers and that's because it doesn't require any solvents or precipitating agents. It is a high speed spinning. It is convenient and an efficient process. But the only limitation in melt spinning is that the polymer must give stable fluid melts below 300 degrees Celsius. That means it should not uh, disintegrate or degrade before um, the temperature is reached. So let us look at the melt spinning line, a typical melt spinning line. So this is how it looks like. We look at each and every part that is labeled here. So this is the polymer feed hopper. It feeds the polymer chips to the feed screw. This is the feed screw and this is the screw drive. It rotates the screw. And then we come to the barrel and the feed screw that is the extruder. Heated barrel melts the polymer and the feed screw pushes the molten polymer further. Then we come to the melt block where the molten uh, polymer is, is coming in and that's called as the molten polymer zone. Then we have the melt pump. It forces the desired quantity of molten polymer further into the filter pack. Here there is a filter pack. It removes the solid impurities, gaseous bubbles and, the, and also homogenizes the melt. Then uh, the melt goes through the spinneret. The cross-sectional shape of the filaments is decided by the shape of the spinneret holes. As soon as the melt comes out from the spinneret, there is this quench air or the cooling zone which solidifies the extruded filaments. Next comes the spin finish applicator where the application of the spin finish is done. Which spin finish is nothing but basically it's a lubricant. Then we may or may not have a set of godets which pulls and draws the filaments to impart strength. Then you have a traverse, yarn traverse which uniformly winds the filament on the bobbin. And finally we come to the wind up bobbin which is the filament package. So now let us take a look at a typical you know melt spinning unit which is a you know pilot plant basically. So let us uh, take a look at all these parts carefully, whatever we have seen in the earlier slide. We can see the filaments coming out from the through the spinneret holes. She is using an instrument for passing the filaments over the godets. helps in drawing the filament. Over the winding unit on the bobbin. The filament bobbin. So now we look uh, in details um, towards the extruder screw and the barrel. This is the image of a screw and a barrel which is uh, barrel is surrounding the screw. One of the more um, one or more close fitting screws are rotating inside a cylindrical barrel. It may be one screw here only one screw is shown. The barrel is heated along its length by oil or electricity. The polymer is partly softened by heat from the barrel walls and partly by the frictional heat developed due to the mechanical shearing of the polymers by the action of the screw. 
so the polymer is softened by two um, uh, in two steps or other one can say because of these two reasons one is the heat that is coming from the barrel walls and the second is due to the mechanical shearing of the polymer itself and which which develops a frictional heat and that leads to uh, the softening of the polymer so let us look at, in detail at the single screw extruders so this is the image of a single screw extruder following distinct regions may be considered along the length starting from the hopper so starting from the hopper one can have uh, different regions feeding melting metering and mixing we look at one by one how uh, they, these regions help the melting zone extends along a considerable length to a point where all the polymer is in the molten form so once the feeding zone is through the melting um, the next melting zone that is there here the polymer starts melting in the metering zone the pre pressure builds up and is a combined effect of the unrestricted flow of the material and the opposing pressure due to constriction at the extruder exit or the back flow so whatever material is being pushed forward through this region through the metering zone is due to the combined effect of the flow that is unrestricted flow that, that is happening that is going to happen because of the screw and at the same time there is an opposing pressure which is coming from the other end of the extruder that is from the exit area where um, the uh, since the material is being pushed through a constricted zone of the spinneret what will happen is there is a back flow pressure that is that is being generated and the uh, melt is um, it is it is trying to push the melt backwards in the opposite direction so it's a combined effect of the drag flow that is an unrestricted flow and the opposing pressure that is coming from the exit of the extruder which is known as a back flow so the volumetric flow or whatever material or the melt is coming out of the extruder will depend on the combined effect of these pressures one in the forward direction and one in the backward direction that is due to drag flow and the back flow and there because of this the overall output might be reduced that's because of the back flow the melt is transported and it is homogenized in the metering zone the material may not be completely homogenized and therefore a close clearance mixing zone is on incorporated to promote intensive mixing so other than whatever homogenization is taking place in this region to improve upon that there is a close clearance zone one can see over here um, the this part is very much close to the wall of the barrel and there is hardly any uh, gap over there and this helps the close clearance helps in uh, promoting intensive mixing in this zone so material movement through the extruder how it happens let us see so here we have a close up view of the screw and the barrel uh, one can see this is the screw and this is the channel which is there the in between space uh, here is called as a channel and uh, the screw this part is known as a flight land if this is the direction of the screw the material will flow in this direction from left to right so um, if the material were to stick to the screw and slip at the barrel suppose the material was to stick over here and the screw is rotating then there would be simply the material will be sticking on the screw and remain on the screw throughout and there will be no output from the extruder because the material will, will rotate along with the screw without being pushed forward so in case of a problem uh, which occurs um, in a normal melt spinning unit where the material output is not there so one must understand that probably the material is sticking to the screw and that is why it is not being pushed out then the other situation can happen where the material starts sticking to the barrel walls and it is slipping at the screw this is uh, quite a situation that one uh, we require where the rotational speed of the polymer is less than that of the screw and the material is forced to move forward so if the material were to stick to the barrel it would be forced forward by the leading edge of this flight and it will be pushed forward and the, you will uh, tend to get some uh, output over here as against the earlier case where the material would stick to the screw rather than the barrel so uh, now let us look uh, this video is just introduced here so that one can imagine uh, when i when i say screw and an extruder you don't get the scale of the or the size of the extruder screw how large it could be so that's why this video has been incorporated here so that uh, one can uh, one need not imagine how big this extruder screw might be
So this is a manufacturing video how the screw is manufactured. So one can carefully see the uh, the flight land as well as the other portions that we just mentioned about the screw. an approximate size of the screw we just saw. Here in this region we can see the close clearance that might be given. So having seen the video on the uh, screw, now let us look at um, screw melters or extruders, um, how they are um, advantages over the grids that were there in the past. In the past, the granules were simply melted on grids or other uh, large heating areas in the form of ribs, something like grid bars and the coils heated them from inside. Now what are the advantages of extruders over grids? They have got much higher melting rates. They've got large capacity, short residence time and there is enough pressure build up which helps uh, the melt to get transported as, and as well as homogenized, greater homogenized of course and delivery of metered quantity of melt. So because of all these advantages, uh, the extruders have now replaced the old grids. And now we come uh, to the next part of this um, uh, melt spinning passage and we shall look at the spinning manifold. Polymers flow from the extruders to the metering pump and the spin packs through a manifold. So in a, in a typical unit, the polymer will flow from the extruder through this manifold which is nothing but a simple network of heated cylindrical pipes. Each pipe is connected to one metering pump. So each one at the end of the, at the other end will be connected to a metering pump. The manifold is designed in such a way that the polymer takes the same amount of time from the extruder outlet to the metering pump, whether it is located near or far away from the extruder to ensure quality of pressure. That means uh, if there are say n number of um, you know metering pumps that are installed for one extruder, in that case it is seen that uh, the manifold is designed in such a way that the polymer will take an equal amount of time. Uh, reaching each one of those metering pumps, whether uh, the metering pump is located near or it is far away from the extruder. This allows uh, or this helps in ensuring quality of pressure and because if the pressure is maintained um, equally in all those metering pumps, it will ensure that the same quality of material will reach the uh, each uh, hole of the spinneret. The tubes and the spinneret are identically heated again to ensure uniform quality. So, uh, in these manifolds or these uh, transportation ducts or the network of pipes that is there, there is something known as a static mixer that is um, that is installed. It is a network of interconnected channels which takes the polymeric fuel fluids from the outer uh, side of the transport ducts to the center and from the center to the peri periphery. That means it is basically trying to mix the entire melt that is coming in through the manifolds. So, it induces shear mixing. 
such a mixer is necessary in pipe flow because the walls of the stationary pipes generate uh, stresses on the fluid so the velocity of the fluid is maximum at the center and minimum near the uh, pipe walls so how does a static mixer which is a network of interconnected channels actually help homogenize the mixture let us see this is a static mixer static means it doesn't rotate it is just stationary and it is installed inside the manifold uh, or the pipes so if this is um, polymers which is coming in one can see because of the shape of the static mixer how it is by the end of that mixer there is a homogeneous melt that one can get one can see as the more material progresses it is homogeneously mixed so now we come to the metering pump after the material is is uh, is distributed via the manifolds and through the static mixer the melt will now come to the metering pump where the material is metered out um, to the spinnerets through a filter we'll come to the filter and the spinnerets um, in the coming slides so first let us take a look at the metering pump it is nothing but simply looking like two gears So we have seen the metering pump. So let us uh, look at it slightly in a little bit more detail. So one must observe here the direction of the melt flow It's coming like this from either side. The melt is coming in this direction. We should also uh, note the direction of the rotation of the gears. So melt input and output directions are perpendicular to the intermeshed gears. It regulates the output or the throughput of the polymer. Uh, from the spinneret throughput rate and winding rate take up rate together decide the denier of the spun filament 
the quantity of the melt passing through the metering pump is given by the number of teeth of the gears getting filled and emptied in a unit time so there is a formula which we can maybe derive uh, just by uh, understanding what is what are the factors here mass flow rate or the uh, material in grams or maybe in weight that is coming out per unit time can be calculated in this manner um rpm into number of teeth would uh, give uh, us the um, the number of uh, teeth that are involved uh, per unit time over year and since there are two gears we multiply by 2 and when we multiply this by the volume between one teeth so uh, we we get the total volume uh, that would be playing uh, that would be playing their part here in uh, per unit time when we multiply that by the density of the melt what we get is the weight uh, that is flowing through per unit time through the metering pump so that's how the calculation goes Uh, so with this we come to the next part of the melt spinning that is the filter pack so one can see this is the filter pack where uh, where the material the melt is filtered before it goes to the spinneret the filter pack is usually graded uh, fine sand or alumina held in place by metal screens or centered metal discs uh, it is a set of filters containing 3 to 5 individual filter meshes where the first filter is a coarse filter followed by a finer one the filters um, should allow small particles therefore uh, or like titanium dioxide which is uh, on purpose added as a delustering agent so the filters of the filter holes are large enough uh, to allow titanium dioxide and uh, um, these uh, these small these small particles may sometimes be added to the fibers so it should allow them Im improper filtration clogs the spinneret holes that leads to the lower throughput and a lower denier filament eventually resulting in a break of the spinning filament so one must take care if the filters are never clogged and if if they get clogged even the spinner it holds um, will not receive the proper amount of melt and the uh, lower throughput would lead to a lower denier filament and sometimes it may even lead to a break of the spinning filament once the polymer is filtered it reaches the distributor um which is shown over here which uh, distributes evenly it ensures a proper supply of polymer melt to all the spinneret holes so now we come to the spinneret um one can see that there is a you know similarity between um this spider which is uh, which is releasing uh, releasing the liquid um and it acts like a somewhat the spinneret um, is based on this idea it is the most important component of the spin pack it is it is a 3 to 30 mm thick plate made of stainless steel with holes up to um, 100 to 500 micrometer which is uh, around 0.5 to 0.05 mm holes drilled into them they are fine holes one can see the holes may be arranged in concentric circles or parallel rows or scatter patterns now this is in concentric circles that it is arranged in a multi hole spinneret the holes are placed in a staggered fashion to allow for air cooling in the quenching zone and also spin without sticking to each other during extruded swell or die swell die swell will be covered slightly later so in case uh, there is a swelling that takes uh, takes place as soon as the melt comes out of the spinneret then in that case the hole should not be too close so that they stick to each other also the holes would be in such a way one can see they are in a staggered there is one hole in between the next um, um uh, two holes in the concentric ring outside one can see that it is staggered in such a fashion that it allows for cooling air cooling uh, in the coming zone that is the next quenching zone to allow for a uh, good cooling action to happen the hole is uh, shaped like a funnel this hole although it looks like a simple you know um, hole it is um, it is in the form of a uh, shape of a funnel it is wide at the inlet side and eventually narrowing to its ultimate diameter which is maintained for a uh, small amount of length uh, say around 1 to 5 diameters length it is maintained so it is like typically looking like a funnel where it is wide at the top where the melt enters and then it narrows down and it that narrowing will continue for a uh, for a length of around 1 to 5 diameters the cross section of the holes may range from circular to trilobal to even hollow so the heated pack body sometimes extends a few centimeters below and around the edge of the spinneret 
allowing a spun yarn of low orientation but high um, orientation potential to be produced which can be converted to high tenacity yarns so even if the spun yarn has got low orientation at that time but it has got a high orientation potential such um, uh, polymers can be spun easily um, by having a heated pack body which extends a few centimeters below the uh, spinneret so with this we come to the quenching or the cooling system where we see these three typical types where a is the cross flow then this is the b is the outflow and c is the inflow type a mild flow of cooling air at a low temperature of 15 to 30 degrees celsius with low to moderate rh is passed through the quench zone the filaments are cooled to its glass transition temperature below which they cannot be extended uh, the speed at which the filaments reach the glass transition temperature is also the spinning speed the uniformity of airflow is extremely important in controlling the variation in the filament diameter a sudden but even a small change of 1% in the quench air velocity may lead to a change in 0.3 in the cross sectional area of the filament so the uniformity of airflow is also extremely important here so what are the different types of quench chamber configurations as we just saw in b uh, it was an inflow type and c it was an outflow type uh the quench chamber configurations may be cross flow which was which is uh, actually not used because nowadays because of this following reason cooling air flows from one side to the other side of the spinneret it is used when a limited number of fibers are being spun because it doesn't give uniform cooling the quenching or the air flow is coming from just one side um as we saw in the previous slide and it is going to the other side so uniform cooling does not happen in cross flow inflow cooling uh, is the this type b where the cooling air flows from the periphery of the spinneret and flows radially to the center of the spinneret as one can see it is coming the air is coming from the outside and it is flowing towards the inside of the uh, spinneret and the air would come down um, along the fibers as it is being spun and be and come out outflow means that cooling air enters at the center of the spinneret somewhere at the center uh, like this and then it is it flows radially outside so b and c are the radial flow configurations they are used for spinning of 10000 or more holes are present whenever a large number of holes are present this kind of a cooling system is used since filaments are more common uniformly cooled in radial flow than in a cross flow the structure and properties of a spun filament are more uniform fine fibers are also spun in the radial type quench chambers so then we come to the spin finish applicator after uh, the quenching zone there is a spin finish application that is done um, after the filaments reach glass transition temperature that means once uh, the filaments are cooled to the glass transition temperature only after that a kiss roll or a spray technique is used to apply spin finish the finish is normally sprayed in high speed spinning machines um the spin finish provides lubrication to reduce the friction between the filaments and the metallic or the ceramic machine parts it allows for even anti static property uh, to allow for the dissipation of static charge generated due to contact of yarn with the machine parts and it um, provides some amount of cohesion to keep the filaments of a yarn together so that unwinding becomes easier from the spun cake next is the take up winder uh, so this is the last part where uh, the filaments once formed are taken up by the winder uh, to be wound up onto the bobbin usually the yarn is not directly wound on the winder but is passed through a take up godet or a set of godet rollers um the godet rollers allows for drawing to happen after spinning to increase the strength of the filaments also the spun filaments are drawn between the godet rollers before winding the bobbin may be friction driven as shown in the first case over here driven by a friction roller and the surface speed remains constant it is not used since the yarn uh, would have to come to come in contact with the friction roller as can be seen over here which results in the poor quality yarn so the second type is the straight winders where the bobbins are directly driven by the motor speed of the winder is regulated to maintain a constant tension in the spinning line and the quality of the yarn is maintained so uh, next we come to the technical data that um, we could understand uh, what kind of uh, speeds and what kind of cooling uh, temperatures or um, the cooling times that we are talking about so spinning speeds may be from 4000 meters per minute to 6000 meters per minute spinning speeds between 3000 to 4000 give partially oriented yarn 
which require a further drawing of a uh, uh, drawing during a draw texturizing moisture content in the polymer chip should not exceed 0.05% by weight for nylon 6 and 0.005% for uh, polyester or pet uh, the conditions are more stringent for polyester here screw diameters used for polypropylene are in the range of 45 to 300 mm and the length is normally 28 to 30 33 times the diameter melting capacities of extruders are in the range of 50 to 2000 kg per hour there are a few more points for fine filaments metering pumps of 1 to 4 cubic centimeters capacity per revolution and 10 to 35 rpm is required for coarse filaments the capacity required is around 20 cm cube per revolution the melting pumps must be capable of feeding against high back pressures of 20 to 200 bars um, if you remember the back pressures we are talking about from the exit of the extruder so um, such kind of pressures it should be able to withstand without change of feed rate and with a precision of plus 2 plus minus 3% sand particle uh, size in the filter would be from 20 to 80 micrometer a bigger particle than 1/10 to the diameter of the final filament may result in a break and additive to the polymer must not only be smaller in size but also should not agglomerate or form small um, you know or come together and form um, uh, small coagulations and uh, then they would form bigger particles and such particles would then uh, increase the breakage rate because efficient filtration uh, would not happen over there uh, and if the filtration is efficient uh, we can see that the breakage rate uh, comes down uh, to um, say maybe even 6 breaks per 1000 kilos which is a good figure so coming to the number of holes in the spinneret it may vary from 2 to 4 for monofilaments and up to 60000 for the heads producing staple toes pulling times of fine filaments have been reduced to 0.05 seconds the molten polymer bulges slightly on emerging from the spinneret this happens due to the release of elastic energy stored during the shear flow through the narrow channels of the spinneret we'll uh, look into a little bit more detail later on this is called as a dicewell effect so with this we come to the end of the lecture Thank you.